bring its content, tries to just focus more on the material aspects, the ideological aspects, and not go too much into stuff like that might cause triggering responses. And there is one slide which has kind of transphobic references where I'm quoting someone, and I'll give you a warning before that. Okay, be happy with that. And can you all hear me okay? Yeah. yeah cool. And also, America at present is the most well-documented example of this new form of reaction that's coming on at the moment. There are, of course, other forms of reaction coming around in different parts of the world, which we'll discuss briefly, but most of the literature on the subject and the most well-covered stuff is from America. It's a kind of joke I make semi-regular that Donald Trump's election was a great thing for left-leaning journalists because it did actually give them ample material to write endless stuff about. So it's kind of a dark humor in that. Anyway, um, what am I talking about? So I'll start off with a brief overview of the re-emergence of the far right and the various countries that it is um, most visible in. And of course, it's not going to be an exhaustive list, but it's a starting point to get an understanding of. Um, exploring the ideology of the new far right and the material conditions that gave rise to it. We are a social society, I am a socialist, so understanding these material conditions is important. There is a kind of like material, uh, dialectical materialism in this, and these ideas just haven't emerged out of nowhere. And I say examining the far right in New Zealand and Austral Australian context, it shouldn't say Australian. I, do, I had much grander ambitions when I first started doing this and I've cut all the Australian stuff. So the most I'll probably go into that is a slight anecdote about me in Australia. That's about it. <laughs> um, and ending optimistically, just kind of like a what can we do kind of thing. Just to be sort of like optimistic and not have everyone leaving, just feeling like it's all doom and gloom. Cool. But first, this quote is amazing. Um, I'll draw your attention to a word, which is the asterisk word about halfway down, quixotic, which is a word that is not in common usage anymore because that word got superseded by the word ideology. The first time the word ideology was published was in 1796, pretty sure, from what I've read about the subject. So, and it superseded the word quixotic. But this quote is Thomas Paine writing on Edmund Burke and Edmund Burke's reaction to the French Revolution. So, when we see a man dramatically lamenting in a publication intended to be believed that the age of chivalry is gone, that the glory of Europe is extinguished forever, that the unbought grace of life, if anyone knows what it is, the prize is gone, and all this because the quixote, the kind of like ideological, age of chivalry nonsense is gone, what opinion can we form of his judgment, or what regard can we pay to his facts? By the rhapsody of his imagination, he has discovered a world of windmills, and his sorrows are that there are no quixotes to attack them. But if the age of aristocracy, like that of chivalry, should fall, and they had originally some connection, Mr. Burke, the trumpeter of the order, may continue his parody to the end. To finish with exclama uh, sorry, and finish with exclaiming a fellow's occupation gone. I love this quote because it highlights how the language of conservatism hasn't changed in close to 300 years. There's still this sense of the glory of Europe has extinguished. Um, the age of chivalry is gone. These are still talking points for members of the far right today. And here's Thomas Paine in 1791 accusing Edmund Burke of exactly that, the same thing that large swathes of the far right continue to do today. So. They've been using this reaction, these forms of reaction, this form of discourse for centuries. Cool, brief overview of the new far right. Again, this is oh, oh so brief, but it's just as like a jumping off point. Um, right wing populism is becoming increasingly mainstream in parliamentary politics in particular. The most prominent examples are Trump in America, Modi in India, Bolsonaro in Brazil, and we have some Brazilian comrades here for whom this is probably a little bit too real. Um, Le Pen in France, Brexit in Britain, obviously. We've got Kurt Wilders in the Netherlands, and there's just the ongoing liberal leadership in Australia, whichever one is in power at any given day. It's just a merry go round.
Um, um, I've included this book, and you can't read that, it's too small, because the title of this is the book from Kurt Wilders, and if you're not familiar with him, he's the leader of the Party for Freedom in the Netherlands, which is the anti-Islamist party, the anti-immigration, anti-globalization party. And the name of the book is March for Death, Islam's War Against the West and Me. And he's just positioned himself as this martyr for Western civilization, and it is just kind of embarrassing, for me at least anyway, for having like Dutch relatives and Dutch family, that this man has taken it upon himself to fulfill his own almost messiah complex that the entire he alone is standing against the tides of Islam invading Europe. And it is, yeah, I guess, it's, yeah. Um, so yeah, there is a weird global trend towards the right in parliamentary politics in a lot of ways. It's becoming re-emergent in ways that it wasn't, at least as far as I remember, five, ten years ago. Um, why this matters? It creates a climate that is conducive to moving further to the right. So it moves the centre to the right. So if we have lots of parliamentary politics, bourgeois politics, which is being practised and the right, it moves the centre to the right, which mainstreams a lot of far-right ideas. That's what happened in America with the Tea Party, and we'll touch on that point briefly. Yeah. And this quote is from David Newark. He's, this is a quote, not from his book, which is Old America, that one, you probably can't see that far away, but from the talk he gave at the Word Festival last year, um, that Old America is an epistemological bubble comprised of conspiracy theories, alternative facts, and outright fabrication. So epistemology is basically ways of knowing, a way of understanding. So he's basically, you know, the study of reality, I guess. Um, so he's basically saying that this new form of reaction is just basically an in inventing a world that is convenient for their understanding of reality. They're inventing a world that works for their ideology, and that's kind of what's happening. So yeah, in the American context, and this is just a oh so, oh so too brief um, history of some points which are meaningful. In 1977, the Ku Klux Klan attempts to create border patrols declaring white American second-class citizens. The grandmaster of the Ku Klux Klan at that time was David Duke, who re-emerged during the Trump campaign as one of Trump's chief, chief cheerleaders. And correct me if I'm wrong, didn't Trump refer to David Duke as a good guy with words to that effect at some point? No. Yep, yep, there you go, some information on that. So yeah, so, David Duke, while in leadership of the Ku Klux Klan, started border controls and declared white people in America second class citizens. Um, in 1998, the phrase cultural Marxism gets used politically, publicly, sorry, by William Lind, leader of the Free Congress Foundation. The Free Congress Foundation was like a far right organized their enemies, their political enemies, and it had very obvious anti Semitic subtext. So the, the re-entering of that phrase into the public lexicon is an example of these ideas coming back into the mainstream, being reimagined in certain ways. 9-11, 9th of September 2001, um, attack on the Twin Towers. This becomes a bit of a touchstone point because it changes a lot of the rhetoric, a lot of the language used by the far right from being outwardly anti-Semitic to becoming outwardly anti-Islamic. And within that, you start getting increased support in the mainstream as their anti-Islamic messaging becomes more normalized. Obviously, there's still anti-Semitic elements, but they've become secondary to the anti-Islamic elements. And obviously, before 9-11, they weren't like super happy about Islam either, but it wasn't the main point of concern. So then, 2001 to 2008, you have the Bush years, the war on terror, and the increased intensification of the Islamophobia during that time. And in 2008, you had the election of Barack Obama. 
and this became a weird touchstone point for the Tea Party and the militia movement that the Tea Party enabled and mainstreamed. The Tea Party got very close to the mainstream Republican Party. Sarah Palin was John McCain's running partner, but ideologically and politically, the Tea Party had more in common with militia groups like the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters, who would function on border patrols, who would act as neighborhood watches in small rural towns that couldn't afford a police force anymore because funding had been cut in these sorts of areas where they would use that as a position to push their ideas, which were largely um, to the extreme right, anti-Semitic, um, white nationalist, those kind of ideas. Um, 2009, statistics on outrage media booming. Um, the Obama administration was a great time for outrage media. So you have people like Rush Limbaugh with a weekly audience of 20 million. Limbaugh is accredited with popularizing the term feminazi. And it's worth keeping in mind that while these people are doing this, they're also complaining that the media is too far to the left, kind of conveniently ignoring the fact that they are the media. <laughs> but anyway, so Rush Limbaugh with a weekly audience of 20 million, popularizing the term feminazi, Sean Hannity, weekly audience of 13.25 million, as bad as Limbaugh, and Mike Savage, who as far as I can tell, is just a straight up honest white nationalist, with a weekly audience of 8.25 million. So, yeah, outrage media boomed during that period, and within this you have the weird conspiracy theories like the Bertha theory in particular about the Obama administration. That's how a lot of these guys cut their teeth and got into prominence, which Trump was also a supporter of. Um, I just added these dates in because this is far too chilling. Um, 16th of June, you have the 2015, Trump announces his candidacy, and the next day, the Dylan Roof terrorist attack occurs. I don't want to go into too much detail about that, but it was a hate-motivated attack on black population in New Zealand. And a uh, slight aside, Dylan Roof has actually been the first person who's been given the death sentence under the anti-terror legislation in America. So, so yeah. you said it was a uh, New Zealand. Did I? Yeah. Oh, it was America, sorry. Dylan Roof, this was in America. <laughs> sorry. Thank you, David. Um, and 2016, Trump gets elected. Yes. And then we had the Charlottesville and the continuation of that to where we are now. So, just a brief overview of how we got to where we are, and now we'll have a look at the ideological and the material conditions that gave rise to it. As I said before, I think it's really important to look at the material conditions, because that's what makes us socialists, this desire for materialism and understanding the material reality that gives rise to these things. So. I apologize for the giant block quote, but I really like this quote, so you're getting it in bulk. <laughs> and this is this book, which is Hinterland, America's New Landscape of Class and Conflict, and it's a great book about this subject, and the prose is amazing, it's really poetic. <clears throat> what we might call traditional fascism or Nazism is not coming back in any recognizable form. Since these far-right phenomena were born of a now extinct mass politics, their programs and aesthetic developed through a combination of the Mises and romantic rejection of the workers' parties of the 20th century, the contemporary far-right can only be characterized as fascist or neo-fascist insofar as one follows the terms of their historical content, excuse me, until they designate little more than the inclusion of racist or misogynistic elements in a political program. As a shorthand, fascism is accurate enough. But at a theoretical level, it tends to imply a false historical analogy. The new far right is still embryonic. It's difficult to predict exactly how it will develop, but the conditions that determine its development are more or less visible. So the key point here is that false historical analogy, in my opinion, and how this new far right is still embryonic. There are differentiating factors that make this different from historical fascism and fascism is a weirdly unique and specific thing, in particular the now extinct mass politics reference here, I'll go into that in greater detail. But, as you said, it's difficult to predict how 
how it will develop, what the conditions at the beginning of this development are more or less visible, and so we just want to have a look at those to see how we got into this position. Zero conditions in America. In 1971, the median household income was 56,329. In today's currency, uh, today, or 2013, the stats are from, it is $50,054. So real income has actually decreased for the median income in America, while the next stats show you it has income has increased for the wealthiest people. Between 1983 and 2009, the top 5% of Americans took home nearly 82% of all the wealth gained, while the bottom 3 fifths lost 7.5%. So from the economic policy perspective. So increased inequality, the poorest people, not even the poorest people, the median income people losing large amounts of their well, it's not their what how would I say this wages are less than stagnant. They're losing wages rather than wages just being stagnant during periods of growth, which is the neoliberal economic policy. We've been promised that it trickles down. There's increased growth, but wages are actually, in real terms, getting smaller. Um, the 483 counties that Hillary Clinton won in 2016, I believe, that should say 2016, not 2015, one generated 64% of American economic activity opposed to the 2,584 county Trump won at 36%, and it should say 2015, I'm sorry, Lisa more than 2015. So anyway, the point of that, Trump's support base came from areas of lower economic output. And I have seen there was a big hoo-ha, a, a conversation that happened around Trump's election. And there was an argument, some people were saying that this was just like a betrayal of the working class, and there were other people who were saying that it was still the wealthy that supported Trump. I guess there's an element of, you have to question about how some of the stats are recorded, but in economic terms, the areas that Trump was successful in winning the election were the areas of low economic output. And these areas were largely rural areas that have higher poverty rates and lower economic output. Poverty is higher in America than um, in rural areas and in urban areas. Um, in absolute numbers, whites still compose the largest single group living in poverty in the United States at about 18 million family units. They are followed by the Hispanic population at slightly over 12 million and the black population at slightly under 10 million. Now, you do it among you will notice that if you add 12 and 10 million together, it is more than 18 million. But, so, there are still proportionately more people of colour living in poverty than there are white groups, but that chunk of 18 million family units living in poverty exist, and they feel as though the current economic climate has completely abandoned them. And that gives rise to the mythology of the far right and becomes a place for the far right to prosper because a lot of these people felt betrayed by the Democratic Party. Um, as incarceration rates for people of color decrease, incarceration rates for whites are beginning to increase. And this is America. I don't couldn't find any statistics on this in New Zealand when we come back to this, but again, there seems to be the sense of it feeds into the mythology of the far right. Um, and the increased eviction in rural localities within America are uh, around 76% white in population. So basically the material conditions that gave rise to the new far right and Trump winning support in America was the sense that white people had their, had, had their back, had had, the government had turned their back on them. And I will note, obviously, people of colour still out represent white people in prison, people of colour still out-represent white people in poverty and in addiction rates in urban areas, people of colour out-represent white people, but this feeds into the mythology that the far right is doing surrounding, you know, white people are being phased out and that kind of stuff. So, 
History is any indicator of a social plague that if state in the swamps and wastelands with rural friends eventually make their way to the gates of the palace. Death, addiction and imprisonment feed into that apocalyptic atmosphere, with population teetering somewhere between sorrow, apathy and rage. But rural whites won't just die off, as much as urban liberals might prefer such an outcome. Instead, the plague gives flesh the mythology of the far right. And yeah, basically making the argument that this is sort of like disease will start in the rural locality, move into the commuter towns, move into the outer suburbs, and eventually potentially like an almost Maoist turn surround the city and move in from there. So what happens is when we're talking about increased poverty rates for whites is this, well, increased incarceration, increased poverty, the sense that something, their privilege is being taken away, it feeds into what Michael Kimmel in the book Angry White Men refers to as a greed entitlement. And I like this book because it was published in 2013, which means it predates the rise of Trump and the rise of the alt-right. So I find that quite interesting that this was kind of like, for those who are willing to look, it was already there. It was already prevalent and it was very identifiable. Um, a greed entitlement can mobilise one politically, but it is often a mobilisation towards the past. So in this case, an idealised past, a mythologised past, an imagined past of a time that was supposedly better, not the future, to restore that which one feels has been lost. It invariably distorts one's vision and leads to a misdirected anger, often at those just below you on the ladder, because truly they deserve what they are getting far less than you do. So a sense of a greed entitlement, the sense that the people who are slightly better off now than they were before are slightly better off at your detriment, as in they're taking from you to make them better off. And this sense of a greed entitlement is basically the sociological phenomena which is guiding the rise of the far right. And of course, this naturally feeds into a sense of white nationalism amongst these groups because they feel like the demographic shift increased Hispanic populations moving in places like Pennsylvania was particularly um, Luzerne County, a county in Pennsylvania in particular, had an incredible demographic shift that changed from something like 10% Hispanic to 90% white to about 50% Hispanic to 50-50 split in the space of about 30 years. And Luzerne County overwhelmingly supported Trump in the last election, whereas it had historically always been a demographic safe seat. Um, so yeah, and I pulled this quote out because I think this quote highlights that agreed entitlement perfectly. So this is from Richard Spencer, who is the founder of the National Policy Institute, which is a far-right think tank, and he became infamous during the rise of Trump as one of his chief cheerleaders. And he said, look, Martin Luther King, a fraud and a degenerate to his life, and his life has become the symbol of the finisher of white dispossession and the deconstruction of European civilization. Again, there's sh shades of that Thomas Paine quote when he's talking about Emma Burke and that as well, the glory of Europe is lost kind of nonsense. But the sense of agreed entitlement that someone like Martin Luther King led to the enfranchisement of black populations by taking away from white people, very clearly evident in that. Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a non-government organization which operates in the United States, which monitors the activity of hate groups, identifies 148 white nationalist organizations active in the United States in 2018. And this quote is just highlighting the racist so-called old right came into prominence in 2015 in white nationalism's most recent formulation with the themes of white disposition, nostalgia for pre-1960s, and the desire for superficial remain crucial to the ideology. So there's that agreed entitlement coming through again. It edges the softer and porous, allowing for the influence and inclusion of more radical elements, including a suite of neo-Nazi organizations. So again, the alt-right is just the most recent manifestation of this far-right form of reaction. And I'm kind of skeptical of using the term alt-right as well because it's their euphemism. It's what they refer to themselves as. 
and in a lot of ways the alt-right only got attention paid to them because they were active in the economic centres, whereas the militia movement, who were actually active in the rural centres, who were the ones that actually basically enabled Trump to get elected and this far-right power shift to happen, are probably more than happy for all the media attention to be based on this small group of what essentially amounts to frat boys on campuses all kicking up a fuss. So I'm sceptical of using the term alt-right, but that's the quote from the Southern Poverty Law Centre. And we won't read all of this, it's just the part, the last sentence, which is really important, that leftists are thus entirely correct when they claim the immigration debate is filled with racist dog whistles. And that's a quote from Richard Spencer. That's Richard Spencer basically admitting himself that the contrast between illegal immigration and legal immigration is just code for talking about people of colour immigrating and white people immigrating. And they're readily admitting that. Like, this isn't a conspiracy on our part of the left anymore. There are people involved with the far right who readily and openly admit to it being a dog whistle for them being speaking in code. Hostile media phenomenon, and this is the thing that explains Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and those kind of people. It posits that those who hold radical political views view the media as being oppositional to those views. And these stats, the popular perception is that the media was really critical of Trump during the 2015 election cycle, but in reality, according to this Harvard Kennedy School's Joint Steam Center on Media Politics and Public Policy study, found that overall 62% of Hillary Clinton's press was considered negative and 38% positive, while Trump was 56% negative and 44% positive. So basically it's saying Trump got more positive press coverage than Clinton did. Now I'm not saying Clinton was an amazing candidate, far from it, but the way in which the far right outraged media in some aspects, yes. Um, but the way the outraged media represented the issue, they just assumed that the media was just going all in, had an agenda, was part of this conspiracy trying to delegitimize Trump, when in reality there's very little to any evidence that supports that. And that comes back to those epistemological bubbles, those conspiracy theories, that alternative world they're trying to create founded by alternative facts. It doesn't necessarily matter that there isn't any evidence for it. What matters is that they can convince people that that is the case. And it fits their narrative, it fits their worldview very conveniently. And I'll come back to this point as well because you can see this in New Zealand media with particular people in mind. Um, this is probably going to be the most controversial point I cover in this talk and something that makes this element of the far right very different to some of its previous iterations. The new far right has anti-capitalist elements in it. I'm not saying that these are universally accepted amongst the far right in general, but there are groups within the far right that do push a kind of anti-capitalist position. And the reason for that is they have a distrust for corporate control. A lot of the far right conspiracy theorists, especially people like Alex Jones, re regularly reiterate the point about corporate control. And if you're not familiar with Alex Jones, he was recently banned from Facebook. He was a he founded the website InfoWars. He came to fame, prominence during the Obama years, I'm pretty sure. He was part of the outrage media boom that the far right latched hold on to. Hugely involved in the Bertha movement and the Trufa movement before 9 11. So, in the yeah, extreme scale of the far right outrage media. And I think Donald Trump appeared on his show twice over the course of it existing as well. Um, anyway, so he in particular pushed this distrust for corporate control. 
It is mild as articulation. It is a conflict between Main Street capitalism and global capitalism. So this idea that the global corporations are destroying the mom and pa shops. And there may be some truth to that statement. At its most radical, this sentiment is expressing that capitalism is no longer considered a vehicle for white supremacy. And this is where my anecdote from Australia comes in. I remember being at an anti-fascist protest in Australia, and one of the speakers was an Aboriginal woman. And she was a very good speaker, very, very passionate about it, and very proud and very powerful. But she talked about how Aboriginal people had experienced 300 years of fascism in Australia, which is a historical inaccuracy because fascism wasn't a thing until the 1920s. What she was talking about was capitalism as a vehicle for white supremacy, as it previously was, as it was articulated and mandated in the philosophy of people like John Stuart Mill and John Locke. So the new far right, and this is largely to do with the continuation of affirmative action and the diversification of liberalism, trying to get uh, to like multiculturalism with the managing of the economy, no longer necessarily considers capitalism a viable vehicle for white supremacy like it used to be in the way that it managed the slave trade and the way that it broke up fam Aboriginal families and destroyed communities in Australia and the way that it wreaked havoc with the indigenous American population and so on. So, yeah. So this takes a form and it borrows from the historical national anarchy, what national anarchy was around in the 1920s, um, and it's a form, think national socialism, but for anarchy, a form of right-wing anarchy that rejects modernity, that groups like Generation Identity, the Identitarian Organization in Europe, more closely aligned to than traditional fascism. And this is, it has an anti-modernity element, it has an anti-capitalist element, it is for the re-tribalization of communities based along ethnic national lines, as in you have your tribe, and their tribe is understood as being white European versus the other. So, I apologize for the block quote. Um, these anti-capitalist elements are expressed in ways which almost make them seamlessly enter into some left-wing spaces at times. So, as this quote says, as one of the poorest generations in history, debt uh, and rent are the defining features of our lives. It is this fact that makes the current incarnation of the far right an actual threat, because it increases the probability that some variant of present day patriot politics might actually find a mass base as a program formulated specifically to oppose the extraction of rent from an unwilling population in the far hinterland is translated into a more general opposition to rent as a primary form of exploitation in contemporary capitalism. This could rapidly move the far right inwards, so to speak, building them a base among the poorer denizens of the sprawling American cities. And this isn't new, necessarily. Historically speaking, socialists and the far right have kind of fought an ideological battle over the same members of the working class two different ends. But the idea here that anti-exploitation of rent is something that a lot of people on the left, or most people on the left, would agree with. But it's being formulated and can be practiced through the patriot politics that the militia movement wants to read communalization along ethnic national lines and the breakdown of modernity. So there are some anti-capitalist elements in the new right. Um, this is interesting because the popular conception of fascism is that it is the management of capitalism in crisis and that it comes up in times of crisis to ensure that capitalism is able to reproduce itself, such as Nazi Germany and Italian, um, fascist Italy having a completely functioning free market that was very important for the general idea of the ideology. The stuff surrounding white supremacy and all the general awfulness was just part of that and part of how they sought to manage capitalism. 
So, that's basically a brief overview of how the new far right is manifesting itself in America and Europe. Um, I'm kind of anticipating a lot of contention on that last part about the new far right having anti-capitalist elements, which you are more than welcome to just throw at me during the questions. So, and I look forward to it. New Zealand, um, according to the parliamentary New Zealand electorate profiles, 45.6 of New Zealanders over the age of 15 that are eligible to work are in full-time employment. That means the rest of the population is either unemployed, or working part-time jobs, or working multiple part-time jobs, which is quite poor. I'm not sure if we can, can you read those numbers okay? Mm -hmm. okay. No. Um, no. Anyway, lots of zeros. Lots of zeros. <laughs> Primary industry is generating least economic output. Um, the first one here on that list is oh, it's gross domestic product by industry change from September 2018 quarter. The first industry is agriculture, forestry, and fishing, which is at generating $22 million less than the previous quarter. Uh, mining follows, which is $12 million less. Manufacturing follows, which is $25 million less. Electricity, electricity, gas, water, and waste services, which are $19 million less. So, primary industries are generating less economic output, meaning that the economic system, oops, capitalism is in full crisis, I guess you can say, and it's developing. The industries that are performing well are things like the service industry, because its service industry is dominating, it's where like about 60, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but a ridiculously high percentage of the workforce actually work in the service industry now. And areas like tech, but tech is one of those weird things where you have like 1% of the population working in it and it generates about more than 1% of the economic output. It's one of those very loaded industries. Um, increase, in, increase, uh, increasing incarceration rates and growing prison populations. Boy, you cannot see that at all. I'm so sorry. Um, the top one is prison population total. The bottom one is prison population rate. The key point there is that they're both trending upwards. And you can see that the snake is going upwards. So population rates are increasing. Incarceration rates are increasing. There's the sickness of incarceration is encroaching more and more and more onto daily life. And again, this is something that has I have relatives who are in prison, so this is something that's kind of affected me personally. I imagine there's lots of you that have relatives who are in prison, just because of how increasingly common it has become for large swathes of working class people. Um, inequality has increased in New Zealand, and I guess that's also matched with wage stagnation as well. Um, New Zealand's 2.9 million adults own almost $470 billion. Of that, the top 1% of the adult population alone owns 16% of the total wealth. That's just under $77 billion owned by around 29,000 adults. This group and the rest of New Zealand's wealthiest 10% own over half the country's total wealth. So again, massive inequality in a country that prides itself on an egalitarian identity. It just pushes that egalitarian identity, pushes this mythology of the Kiwi dream, to borrow from Labour's um, election propaganda, I guess. And, but the reality of it is the gaps are getting wider and wider and wider. And I see this in my workforce as well. They do yearly pay increases by percentage, which means that the people earning $10,000 get a bigger pay increase than the people earning $40,000 because of five percentage. Apparently it's fair, apparently it's a fair way of doing it, but it is just a coded way of perpetuating inequality. Same as tea. Yeah, same as tax. Yeah, GST is a classic example. Everyone needs to eat. We're all paying the same 15%. Yeah, exactly. So it's disguised fairness, means that benefits people who earn more. So increasing inequality in New Zealand. Outrage media in New Zealand. We have Mark Richardson saying it's time for New Zealand to get its own Fox News because, according to Mark Richardson, 
the majority of New Zealand's media is left-leaning. They sit on the left side of the spectrum. Let's not deny that fact. Mark Richardson is saying this on April the 17th, 2019, two days over a month after the March 15 attack. And he's upset that supposedly the media is showing the smallest shred of compassion. I'm a bit... I don't understand why he would pick that time to say that kind of thing. But again, it's another one of these examples of, aren't you in the media, Mark? Aren't you, you're complaining about the media being left wing, but aren't you part of it? Um, and Mike Hosking, who everyone is probably all too familiar with. Why is the US media so dishonest about Donald Trump? Um, I'm not sure, well, it might be, but 62% of Clinton's coverage is negative and Trump's was 56%. Trump seemed got more positive coverage than Clinton. I, yeah. Again, and that's just one such example I can find. You could probably, Mike Hosking is just kind of awful, for lack of a better word. I just can't understand why he becomes. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So Mike Hosking is basically being dishonest about the US media just because he kind of has a weird situation for Trump, I guess. Um, Sean Plunkett. It's apparently toxic masculinity isn't a problem, toxic feminism is. Yeah. And, and apparently the woke left and the feminazis will try to ban rugby within two years. And I wish we were that organised. I, I wish we could arrange such a campaign in this country but that seems incredibly unlikely. And also a great way to get large swathes of the working class to hate us. Um, yeah, and it's worth keeping in mind that Rush Limbaugh popularized or mainstream the term feminazi. So when Sean Plunkett uses that term, well, just even the, what it connotes, like comparing feminists to the Nazis to start with, but surely he has to know where that term comes from. And if he doesn't know where that comes from, surely that just would not fit to do what you do as a job if you don't actually know where these ideas come from. It's a media personality. And yeah, and that's not to mention the more less mainstream whale oil, Cameron Slater, Kiwi blogs, David Sparrow, and Right Mind, who's the mouthpiece of the New Zealand Conservative Party. And I was going to show you one of their articles. I will spare you that and just tell you what it was. It was published a month to the day after the March 15 attack. And it was a parody, I think they're trying to be parody, I think they're trying to be funny, of them going on a hunt around the University of Auckland trying to find the rare and fabled and endangered white supremacist a month after that. And then what they do do is say, we didn't find any white supremacists but we found lots of anti-racist postering. And it's just kind of like, of course you found a lot of anti-racist postering. This is a month after one of the worst hate crimes, not just in New Zealand, but in the world, happened. But they seem awfully upset about that. And it is very just kind of like, one of those moments where you have just kind of outed yourself as being supporters and cheerleaders of this kind of hate and this level of hate. And it is absolutely abhorrent it's just disgusting. I have no word for it. Mm, it's outrage media is alive and well in New Zealand, and we have Mike Hosking as the primary example of it. Um, these are quotes I have pulled from the archived web pages of the Dominion movement because apparently they don't know how the internet works and you just can't delete your web page and it doesn't go away forever. Um, it's the anti capitalist elements things, and there's Globalist financial powers dominate our economy, attacking the wages of Kiwi workers by encouraging globalization and immigration, and involve us in international conflicts which do not benefit our country. Again, it's the anti-globalist financial powers, which there is a little bit of dog whistling going on there to be sure, because it's anti-Semitic, but taking literally, they are just referring to global capitalism as being a net negative. 
This next quote, which I find hilarious, because they kind of imply that they are the true enemies of capitalism in this quote. Um, let's see if I'm going to put a half of it away. Because the system and the so-called revolutionaries have a common cause, the crushing of any dissent against the international liberal system. The far left is manipulated as useful idiots for the global capitalism that they claim to hate. Which they're almost implying that they are more anti-capitalist than the left, which is kind of bizarre. Uh, wrong post. Yeah, cool. And this one, it's just a little One New Zealand party, which is just finding these weird kind of little far right parties that pop up on Facebook. But the key point in that is the Corporation of New Zealand thing. Again, it's making referencing that weird kind of distrust of corporate control that this new far right has. Um, and yeah, so that there is kind of that anti-capitalist element, that anti-capitalist undercurrent that exists in some of the new far right, and it's present in the New Zealand context as well. And I think it's worth mentioning briefly, and we are near the end as well. So you're doing great, good job. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, that oh, what was it? The Kyle Chapman interview for Radio New Zealand that he did, where he kind of almost implies that we're the we're the good far right people, they're the bad far right people, and I feel like he kind of intuitively identified a difference between them and the Dominion movement, the National Front and the Dominion movement, because the National Front appealed much more to old school fascism. They had flag days. They tried to engage in a mass politics. They were pro capitalism in a sense that the Dominion movement and these kind of new groups aren't so much. So yeah, it's it's weird. It's a really weird interview where he's just kind of given a platform to say, we were the good fascists. These guys, they're the bad fascists. It was bizarre. Um, so this next slide has the reference of transphobia in it. So this is more content warning. I'm not usually a big fan of content warnings because I think they just kind of like break up the flow of talk, but in this context, and people being particularly vulnerable, I'll use it in this moment, so it was kind of gross. I've tried to describe general awfulness, but the reason why I wanted to highlight this is because it's doing the cultural Marxist thing, which directly links it into the cultural Bolshevism discourse that the Nazi party used. And apparently, cultural Marxist subversive advocate for dangerous and repulsive causes like transgenderism and mass immigration. They attack the foundational values of Kiwi society, free speech, the family unit, and patriotism, to name just a few. They support the globalist effort to replace the diversity of mankind as a rootless, undifferentiated, mongrelized humanity. No unique countries, cultures, or peoples would exist in their nightmare vision for the future. It's a, it, again, it's kind of like I wish we were that organized. Again, I feel like they're shadow boxing some kind of monolithic left that they, um, they can keep doing it. I'm not going to stop them, but it is just but one day. Yeah. One one day, day. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's that cultural Marxist anti Semitic reference to old school Nazism. General bigotry, I guess, is the way to sum up some of this. It's just, it's just awful. General awfulness. Um, and there has been some political pandering to this kind of stuff, even from the political parties that we would identify as the quote left in New Zealand. Now we know the National Party does it, they had the immigration combat. Um, petition up and they were supporting that. So the National Party, Simon Bridges, it was just a yeah, terrible person. Um, <laughs> um, so the left is like that. But this is Winston Peters, but I also think he's a terrible person, from 2005. It basically, well, I'll just say a quote. In other words, we are being colonized without New Zealanders having some say in the numbers of people coming in and where they are coming from. This is a deliberate policy of ethnic engineering and repopulation. That could come straight from the Dominion Movement website, and you wouldn't even realize, but this is a quote from the current 
Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand about 14 years ago. And I accept that people can change in 14 years, but it's a dangerous kind of situation we have where someone who once endorsed these kind of conspiracy theories is now the second most powerful person in the country. Um, even the Green Party has a policy of sustainable immigration, which is a weird kind of discursive sleight of hand where they're sort of like, we can only let X amount of numbers of people into the country. But the problem with these kind of discursive sleights of hand, it comes back to that Richard Spencer quote about illegal versus legal immigration. It's when you're talking about sustainable immigration, a lot of the time you're not thinking about a sustainable number of people from Africa or the same sustainable number of people from Southeast Asia. They're thinking about a sustainable number of skilled workers who fit into our workforce. And because this was a predominantly dominant predominantly European dominant society, the workforce skills reflect European values much more. And that also follows on from this quote from the Labour Party immigration policy. We will do this by making sure work visas are not being abused. Key word is abused. I don't know how you abuse a work visa. To fill low skill, low paid jobs while ensuring that businesses can get the skilled workers they need. And I have always found the skilled versus unskilled immigration rhetoric to be really problematic and it hurts me the wrong way and it becomes dangerously close to that illegal versus legal immigrant discourse as well. It's just like one step removed from that and it goes back to what I just said. When you think of a skilled worker in a European workplace, you think of like, you know, a graduate, a university graduate from England. When you think of an unskilled worker, you may think of like this Filipino dairy farmer, for instance. So there is that coded language exists within the New Zealand political parties that are currently in power. And I have seen this controversially, I might add, at some sort of like not politically charged situations, that if the attack on March had have happened in America under the Trump administration, there would have been about at least half a dozen op-eds written within 48 hours talking about how Trump has emboldened white supremacists. But it happened under the cultural climate and the political climate that was largely engineered by the Labour Party and New Zealand First, and I do think they need to be held accountable for that. Just to get to my rallying cry for the evening. Um, so yeah, um, last part, this is very short, but it's not without it's content, keep it short, I'll share it. The far right is very good at offering solutions. These solutions do nothing to help working class people in any meaningful way, but they're very good at offering solutions. They scapegoat, they say, that person is the reason why you don't have a, your rents are high, if we get rid of them, rents will go down. That is kind of the, yeah, it's not true. It doesn't work like that at all. Rents are high because landlords have near monopoly prices on the marketplace. Um, wages are low is because employers, it's, it, it's landlords and employers that are the reason why your rents are high and your wages are low. Um, the pe people, immigrants, working class immigration, these people are actually potential allies in a collective struggle against high wages, high rents. They're not the cause of them. But that doesn't matter. The far right offers these solutions. They're wrong. They're fundamentally wrong but they offer them and they're simple. It's, in their eyes, it's as simple as building a wall across the border. And that's kind of thing. And it is bizarre. Um, and the problem is there's no political parties offering any meaningful solutions to this at the moment. And that is very evident in the recent capital gains tax debacle that the Labour Party couldn't even push through what was a very mundane tax reform. Like in Australia, it's the first $10,000 is tax free, for example. That's right, isn't it? 18,000. 18,000 tax free in Australia. Oh well. So yeah, the capital gains tax was proposing $7,000 first tax free and then in increasing the next tax rate that would be offset by the capital gains tax. It was an entirely fiscal neutral process, but they didn't even have the courage to push that through, and I'm not entirely sure why. It was a tax, 
the text of working group was headed by Michael Cullen, he, who is hardly like a proponent for working class politics, and yeah, there was a chance, just a small thing that could have helped, and the political parties just think of the status quo as it existed. And the thing with Australia is that it's had those laws since the 70s, so it had those laws, those tax systems before neoliberalism happened, and we haven't, and this is the same in New Zealand, all the workers' rights and stuff we have, we've had since the 70s, we haven't got any much new ones since neoliberalism happened. Um, and yeah, politicians have actively participated in fostering a, an environment of hate at times. See that Winston Peters quote from 2005 is just abhorrent. Um, with this said, we need to be empathetic for the plight of the very real plight that working people are in. And this quote is kind of funny in my opinion. For all of its logic and love of science, modern liberalism as a social force is weighed down by its most consistent flaw, an overweening belief in its own moral superiority, its heroism, as it were. Um, we don't want to be heroes in any way, shape, or form. We just want to, to have meaningful existence, fruitful lives, as do most people. So. We just need to be empathetic towards the fact that there are people who are doing it really rough. And this goes back to the last part as well, and offering them solutions. Because if we don't offer them solutions, someone else will. And part of that solution is being empathetic to their cause and identifying that they have a problem. It goes back to that 18 million family units in America that are living in poverty. They felt like that the affirmative action, the affirmative action programs that were in place to get people of color into managerial positions and that kind of stuff were actively excluding them. So they went, whereas the people on the far right offered them solutions, so they went with them. Yeah. And he said, the future is going to be more positive. I am very optimistic towards that. I do have a utopian streak to my socialism, which I am unashamed about. And this is a quote from Michael Kimmel, which I agree with wholeheartedly. Unlike those cynical elites who try to steer them towards their own extinction and would happily dance on their graves, I believe these men can turn it around. Make no mistake, the future of America, and by extension the rest of the Western world, is more inclusive, more diverse, and more egalitarian. The choice of these men is not whether they can stem the tide, but they cannot. All the Limbard and Arteo, in the, I'm sorry, I probably butchered that name. In the world cannot put the gender equality genie back in the bottle. Their choice is whether they will be dragged kicking and screaming into that inevitable future or walk openly and honorably into it, far happier and healthier incidentally, alongside those who spent so long trying to exclude. And as I said, I agree with this wholeheartedly. The proposed world that the far right wants is a world of constant crisis. If you have to have a militarized border wall and this is your idea of the future, that is a constant militarized crisis. That is a world in which no one is going to be happy and healthy. What we can do is offer them a happier and healthier world by realizing that a more egalitarian society is good for everyone, and that's the idea we need to push for. These people are not our enemies, they are our potential allies. They have the same concerns as us, they have the same life experience as us. Obviously, they're more disadvantaged, disadvantaged in other ways. I'm not trying to belittle the certain ways they're disadvantaged based on race, gender, sexual orientation, etc. But their disadvantaged position makes them allies rather than enemies in yeah, our struggles against fighting capitalism in a large sense. Oh. So yeah, optimistic towards the future. I think we can have a more egalitarian society, and I don't think we can. I think it is the more logical future rather than a militarized world of constant crisis. Cool. And as just a last thing, I'll leave that up there. We have the Together Against Racism National Day of Action on the 18th of May from 1 o'clock. Um, we'll be meeting in Victoria Square and marching for the Bridge of Remembrance, and there will be speakers. So if you have time, or you can come along to that. Thank you for coming out.